The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello there and welcome from Ventura, California to today's webinar sponsored by Novel and hosted by WebAttract, your end-to-end -end solution provider for informational webinars. I'm Lori Dearman, content producer with WebAttract, and I'll be your moderator and one of your hosts for today's session. And in just a moment, I'll be introducing our panel of thought leaders as today's webinar is about hearing from these experts as they discuss how to maximize reliability and flexibility of critical water systems for production and manufacturing. You'll also have an opportunity to have your questions answered at the end of the presentation during the Ask the Experts panel session with all three panelists. But for now, let's get started, as we have a lot to cover. Now, we've invited you, along with 300 professionals from 35, con 35 countries and 33 states and provinces, representing engineering design, construction, oil and gas, uh, chemicals, power, and other industries to learn what can be done to prepare in terms of emerging needs, selecting better equipment, and avoiding costly mistakes. Now, regardless of your industry segment or location, we're confident that you'll find today's webinar of value. Now, speaking of sharing some thoughts, we'd like to kick things off today with our first poll question. So coming up on your screen right now is our first poll question, and we'd like to hear from all of you. What is your biggest pretreatment headache? So if you would take just a moment to register your thoughts or your vote with us. Is it poor water, raw water quality, insufficient capacity, significant seasonal changes, insufficient monitoring, poor interpretation of data, and inappropriate corrective action. So go ahead and let us know what you're thinking. And in this case, please just select one. All right, we've got, um, looks like poor raw water quality coming in at 35% is our top headache, followed uh, by significant seasonal changes at 25%. And then the remainder, really a, a spread between insufficient capacity, insufficient monitoring, and poor interpretation of data and inappropriate corrective action. So thank you very much for sharing that uh, information with us. And our speakers will be able to use that as they move through the content today and to better customize uh, their message to you. So as I mentioned, the sponsor for today is Novel, and before we get started, I would like to turn it over to the Director of Marketing at Novel, Ross Graber, who will take just a minute of your time to officially welcome you and express what he hopes you'll get out of today. Ross? Thanks, Larry, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ross Graber, and I'm Novel's Director of Marketing. Novel is sponsoring today's webinar, and I wanted to start by thanking you for joining us. If you're not familiar with Novel, Novel provides a web-based application for engineers. Novel integrates technical reference information with analytical and search tools to deliver answers that engineers trust. I'm excited for Novel to be putting on today's event, and I wanted to share why we're hosting this webinar. Whether it's top of mind or not, influent water systems of our, are of critical importance to our customers who design, build, and operate plants and manufacturing facilities. Plants don't operate without water sources, which makes water a resource that needs to be planned around. And water as a resource is harder to come by than ever before, whether it's because of scarcity or regulation. Better design and planning of systems to handle incoming water can create cost savings. And poorly made plans not only can increase production costs, but they can result in downtime or some things worse. With our users turning to Novel for help with difficult technical issues, we saw the opportunity to pull together an expert panel, including two Novel authors and an expert from industry to provide guidance on this topic. I trust that following this webinar, you'll walk away with a greater understanding of the challenges and opportunities which surround Influent Water and a better understanding of available technologies and how you can further minimize risks through better design. You'll leave knowing that you can turn to Novel to learn more about these topics. Now, before I turn this back to Lori, I want to thank our panelists for their hard work in preparing for today's session. I'd also like to say a special thank you to our publishing partners, Chemical Publishing Company and Gulf Publishing Company, for providing the experts for this panel. So thank you again, and I know that you'll find our session productive. Back to you, Lori. 
Thanks so much, Ross, for the warm welcome and for setting the stage for our featured panel, which is comprised of three real thought leaders in this space. Joining us today, we have Lorraine Huckler, founder and president of MarTech Systems, Dave Christofferson from Crown Solutions, a subsidiary of Veolia Water Solutions and Technologies, and Colin Frayne, consultant with AquaSurance. Uh, we'll be hearing first from Lorraine today, so let's start with a bit of background about her. Now, as founder and president of MarTech Systems, Lorraine's consulting services optimize the water and energy circuits in influent steam, cooling, and wastewater systems in industri industrial facilities. Lorraine has presented and published numerous technical papers on subjects including passivation in steam generating systems, pack bed demineralizers technology, reboiler steam side system operation, and non-chemical water treatment technologies. Lorraine is also author of Operating Practices for Industrial Water Management, uh, Influent Water Systems, published by Gulf Publishing, and also available on Novel. Lorraine, I'd like to welcome you to the webinar today. Well, thank you, Lori. It's great to be here. Now, today, Lorraine is going to provide an overview of this presentation and, most importantly, set the stage with ideas about the risks of design mistakes and mismanagement of pretreatment systems. So over to you, Lorraine. Thank you, Lori. Let me repeat that comment about design mistakes and mismanagement of pretreatment systems. It creates risk. So I'm going to start with what can go wrong. In other words, the hidden liabilities in influent water systems. Remember that problems in your pretreatment system can cause problems in all the downstream units that are served by that system, such as steam generating systems, heat exchangers in the cooling water circuit, and process water systems. So let me use an example of, to illustrate what can go wrong in a pretreatment system. This is a photo of a boiler tube, and unfortunately it's exhibit A, the incriminating evidence that a pretreatment system was not functioning properly for a significant period of time. You can see that this boiler tube has a bulge and it was damaged by a slow and gradual accumulation of contaminants that deposited on the heat transfer surface inside the tube, insulating it from the water inside and causing that metal to deform under high temperatures. If you look closely, you'll see there's a perforation on that bulge. And if you're familiar with boilers, you know that there were probably tubes adjacent to this tube affected. And we know that the failure occurred over a long period of time because a rapid accumulation would cause a very different appearance for a failure. And I want to add a footnote here about managing risk. It's important if you have these kinds of incidents to conduct a root cause analysis, examine the tube, and make sure you implement corrective action. Now, Lorraine, I know you have quite a bit of experience in this area. Could you share with us an instance where this has actually happened? Yeah, unfortunately, this situation happens more often than we realize with disastrous results. Uh, one of my clients had a chemical feed line in the cold lime softener. That's the first unit in a pretreatment system. And the chemical feed line ruptured. And there was no chemical fed for four hours until the operator made his rounds and there were no online analyzers to provide an instant warning that something had gone wrong and the plant ended up losing control of the chemistry in that lime softener and allowed suspended solids to transfer into the next unit which was filters and the next unit which was sodium zeolite softeners and the next unit which was a reverse osmosis system and ultimately into the boiler circuit, failing most of the boilers in that circuit. And there was really no way to stop it unless the uh, per personnel had had a warning. It was a single point of failure and it shut down the entire plant. And the message is that problems in the pretreatment system, 
the clarifier, the softener, the deminimalizer, the filters, the reverse osmosis unit, the ultrafiltration system are going to ripple through that entire system into the boilers and the cooling water circuits and the process water and we call that the domino effect and that's why pretreatment systems are so risky they're centralized and they're at the front end of the plant and there's another complexity that creates risk in pretreatment systems and that is declining water quality surface waters have seasonal variation in quality but there's a long-term trend of declining water quality, especially in arid areas. Short and long-term drought conditions are continuing to cause challenges for existing plants. Their pretreatment systems were not designed for water experienced um, during drought conditions. And I'll caution you that even aquifers can be affected and affect your well water quality. And often the plant can't expand their withdrawal permit to get more water from their existing sources and the plant must find alternative sources of water that are usually of lower quality. And I'll come back to this issue in the next slide. And for those of you who are designing plants, you know that it's much more difficult to find high quality water sources for those new plants. And you must also select lower quality alternate sources of water and sometimes you're required to reprocess water and maybe even minimize or el eliminate treated wastewater discharge volumes. So this requirement for smaller water footprint and zero or near zero dis discharge of wastewater is particularly true for new plants. It's affecting existing plants and, and eth the ethanol industry is a good example of this. And when there aren't sufficient sources of raw water available, or it's too expensive, it forces us to get creative and consider strategies like conservation of water and using alternate sources. I have here a schematic of a power plant and on the left hand side you can see the more traditional sources of raw water. We have <clears throat> seawater desalination and well water and surface water, but on the right hand side you'll see we have rainwater as an alternate source. And of course, treated wastewater discharge. And retreating wastewater is an obvious strategy because of the restrictions on withdrawal permits. Some plants choose to retreat individual streams of wastewater within the boundary limits. Others are looking to reprocess some or all of their wastewater discharge at the back end of the plant. And the optimal strategy to minimizing risk and maximizing flexibility, although it's site-specific, it's, it's important to have several strategies to be able to cope with different kinds, different sources, different qualities of raw water, including reusing your wastewater, not just a single treatment protocol. Using chemical treatment programs <coughs> is the fastest and easiest way to mitigate some of these negative effects of the contaminants that are present in these lower quality waters. Um, and treated wastewater, for example, often has ammonia present. And ammonia is a problem in cooling towers because it serves as a nutrient and can cause biological growth and fouling of heat transfer surfaces. It can also cause additional corrosion for the copper alloys in the circuit and chemical additives are available to mitigate some of those effects. <clears throat> Drought also increases the concentration of soluble contaminants that can cause corrosion and scaling. And again, there are chemical strategies that can mitigate some of those negative effects. And Colin is going to discuss the framework of chemical treatment and monitoring programs to mitigate these effects. And it's especially important when you're dealing with low quality water. But Colin will tell you that chemical treatment is a supplement to proper equipment treatment. It can't substitute for equipment. And when there is a large mismatch between water quality, the existing pretreatment system, and the specifications for water of the downstream units that the water serves, additional pretreatment equipment is required.
Dave will discuss new technologies for water treatment and, as shown in this example, new twists on old technology. This slide is showing our old favorite, the lime softener unit, reconfigured. You'll see on the left-hand side there are the sections that are slow and fast mix for coagulation and flocculation. And on the right-hand side is the settling basin with these inclined lamella plates installed on the top in order to reduce the size of the unit and increase the settling rate. So particularly in existing plants where you're cramped for space, these, this smaller footprint can be an advantage um, to specifying a new pretreatment unit. Dave is also going to talk about matching equipment to the quality of the wa raw water source and the operating dynamics. This is what we call the design basis of a system or a fit for purpose. So during this presentation, I hope you'll gain a better understanding of the methods to analyze a water treatment application, craft that all-important design basis, evaluate water treatment technologies, be they equipment or chemical, and identify this match that will minimize the risk of off-spec water or worse, system failure and loss production. Well, thank you, Lorraine, and don't go too far because we'll be calling you back at the end of the program to help us recap and also to participate in the Ask the Experts panel discussion. But at this point, allow me to introduce our next speaker, Dave Christofferson. And Dave Christofferson is Certified Water Technologist and VP Technical Manager at Crown Solutions, a subsidiary of Veolia Water Solutions and Technologies. Dave is over 30 years in-field experience managing water treatment programs for industrial sites for boilers, cooling systems, wastewater systems, and membranes. Dave has operated many field pilots for various chemical and equipment applications, along with performing laboratory treatability studies. He has an extensive background in many industries, including oil seed, steel, manufacturing, power, chemical, mining, and others. He's published several papers and presented with NACE, AWT and IWC. Now, Dave is going to provide more information on equipment and design basis, including designing or managing water pretreatment and purification, along with some practical examples to illustrate these points. So, to get us started, uh, Dave, let's let's dive in with a discussion of how to go about defining system requirements. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Lori, and thank you, Lorraine. So from a, a design, design aspect, it's really best if we get involved early and look at the big picture from the very beginning. So we ask questions to find out really what is the goal, what's trying to be achieved, and it's, it's really good to get input from as many people and all the right people that you can. Um, proper pretreatment design up front will minimize redesigns and disappointments later as the stages in the process develop or um, things uh, develop and the system actually goes into service. So what are the goals? Uh, for example, Lorraine was talking about the active flow softening and in this um, the application might be I need quick starts and stops and the sand ballasted technology of this clarifier attaching sand to the flock actually allows for very high rise rates and very small footprints so the goal here could be satisfied using this technology ask questions like what happens if the system goes down or one component needs to be taken out of service? Are there other available water sources? Are temporary mobile services an option? And for system designs, um, this is a good one, include adequate buffer with properly sized storage tanks. And as a rule, I'd say make the tanks bigger, not smaller, because usually what I see are undersized storage tanks. As an overview to this uh, next slide coming up, I'd say it's, uh, it's really trying to say it's a good idea to get a thorough understanding and then look at several available options. So we call this a total so uh, solutions approach. And it's asking what do you need now, but also consider what do you need in the future as the site expands. What's in the water? You know, what are the constituents of concerns? And I saw in that uh, pre-survey, that people understand that water changes over time. It changes seasonally. It can change during the day. 
So we really need to look at the ranges and how it changes. And then what are the limitations? You know, how much footprint um, do we have? The time requirements, manpower, those kinds of things. So then knowing some of that, you consider what are all the available technologies that could best handle that uh, cocktail that's in the water. And we use a computer um, simulation program that we've developed. So we have a drop-down menu, and we can look at all the different available systems, try different designs. Um, and you can do that in hours instead of days or weeks. So we can look at many, many different systems, and then you can get an optimal integration of all the systems, the processes and chemistries, and look at uh, the results and the capital costs and compare life cycle costs. So. What might happen next then is a treatability study, um, especially if you're looking at recycle water or reuse water, and that's usually done in the lab, uh, and it kind of gives you a clue as to really what you need to do. Um, and then for some difficult waters, it makes sense to go from there out into the field and do a pilot test, and that pilot test can really help you optimize the equipment design and, and make sure that the system's going to work on a full system basis. And then, or um, my last comment on this slide, is really to make sure that you um, look at the specific need of that site uh, and avoid just going with a standard design if it doesn't fit. During the uh, fact-finding or data-gathering effort, we want to get a thorough understanding of all of the water uses and needs. So for a power plant, you ask a question like, what dictates the water quality limits? Is it the steam turbine manufacturers and their warranties? Is it the chemical treatment program? You know, are, are there going to be process contaminations possible? What about condensate polishers? Um, quite a few lately are zero liquid discharge designs, so you've got to consider trying to minimize um, any water discharges or, or maximize recoveries of all the different unit operations. Boiler pressure often dictates water quality requirements, and the amount of steam production and condensate return then that, that's what determines the makeup needs. So what makeup rate is the design flow and what contingencies are available when a condensate return pump uh, fails? Um, what could be the real um, peak flow? Really in the competitive bidding situations, sometimes robust designs, I think, get compromised. Clarifiers, for example, have design you know, rise rates. Conventional clarifier might be a one gallon minute per square foot. Rise, rise rate, um, but what happens as the temperature of the water changes or the conditions change? So you want to avoid designing at the high end of the rise rate. Membrane systems have um, allowable flux ranges. Again, you've got to um, design um, at a reasonable flux rate so that you have, still have available capacity as the membranes foul or um, you're going to see more frequent cleanings also if you if you design for too high a flux rate. For ion exchange, you want to make sure you don't have to regenerate too often. And then on, on the overall design, you want redundancy of equipment and flow capacity. And so things like if you have a clarifier, do you have one clarifier that can handle up to 100% of the flow, or uh, is the situation at the site such that you need a, a backup clarifier? Things like softeners, filters, UF, um, RO, demineralizers, they might have a, a backup so that when one's backwashing or regenerating, you can still handle full capacity. Uh, chemical feed, you might have an installed spare. For controls and instruments, you might have a dual power supply for hot swap, one CPU, and maybe with a shelf spare. Then you want to consider things like bottlenecks. What are potential bottlenecks? look for them in the operation and plan for them. And sometimes they're not so obvious. Uh, sometimes you don't find them until after you start up. In one case, kind of a weird case, a river uh, uh, clarification process at a chemical plant, the limitation turned out to be an undersized sludge box under the sludge press and also a limited sludge collection truck schedule. Uh, at another chemical plant, the limitation of the clarifier occurred when the river water turbidity actually got very low um, the rise weight design was too high for the light flock, and there was no design for sludge recycle or clay, clay feed that sometimes is used to help that kind of situation. Now, on multimedia filters, which are used a lot in, in pretreatment design for removal of relatively low levels of suspended solids, say 10 ppm, 
Um, there's a lot of considerations. You can use different medias. You can use coagulant aids in front to try to improve the, uh, the clarity of the water coming out. And you can get pretty good turbidity out of a multimedia filter, you know, less than maybe 0 0.2 NTU. You can get silt in density index maybe of less than 4. But the one warning I have is that pretty commonly you'll have upsets and you have excursions. And so if you need 100% of the time a, a low SDI, maybe a uh, multimedia filter isn't the best design. Maybe something like a, an absolute membrane, like an ultrafilter membrane, might be a better design. Probably one of the biggest design area mistakes I see is failing to consider how to start up a new system or how to start up after a shutdown or planning for cleaning or how to shut down or store the systems. So in the design stage, think about what would be necessary to commission equipment and make the right provisions. Make sure there are connections that are necessary, valves, pipes, hoses, and tanks to flush and clean each unit operation, and how much time will be needed to clean systems, such as filters, ROs, UFs, and what's the capacity of the, of the rest of the system while a, one of those units is being serviced. If you have an on-site rep um, from the design company on site during the uh, construction, he or she can help make sure that all those things are being considered and the right connections are put in. Now, people often design for the scenario that handles 90, 95 percent of the time, um, you know, the water characteristics for the common water characteristics, let's say. But you also may need to have provisions or design considerations for that other 5 to 10 percent of the time when the water isn't so good, especially if you're starting with an impaired water supply. So things like algae blooms may occur and require special chemistry or, or prevention measures. In uh, one case for a wastewater supply source for a new power plant, uh, we checked out, and we thought we had done a good job, we were checking out all the, the dischargers that go to that local municipality to make sure that we considered all the different upsets that might get through their treatment plants, such as organics or other chemicals. But in the end, what we missed were some slugs of sand and grit that came from that plant, and it caused a problem with one of our screen filters um, at the site And it because uh, it wasn't set up for automatic purging, so we had to make some uh, accommodations for that. So just some or, uh, special considerations. Um, you might be thinking about bacteria, algae, COD, BOD, oil and grease, phosphate, ammonia, metals, like I said, sand and grit. Total dissolved solids sometimes now, aluminum, silica, both colloidal and reactive, uh, THM, refractory organics, and now selenium, and, you know, other ones. So a lot of special considerations. Now, as you uh, just don't want to design for a, a system to be too robust, um, you don't want to over-design and create problems with too much redundancy or too low of flow conditions that might occur, such as channeling through ion exchange, um, at low flow, uh, if you don't want units in standby, they could be corroding. Uh, membrane systems actually like to be running so you can have more biological problems um, when they're not running. So if you've got too many systems, that could be a problem. You've got to consider freeze protection if it's out of, out of service. So really target design flows, but with the right amount of redundancy. For membrane systems, understanding and problem prevention have certainly come a long way in the last several years. There are many membrane options, some being better than others, for sure. But uh, look at the proper design of things like the clean-in-place systems. I was just at a plant today, and the, their whole problem is um, uh, design of the clean-in-place system for the RO. Consider flux rate and water temperature ranges. Consider the membrane selection. Look at the type, the feed spacer size, the total service area per membrane. And in the flow designs, consider the percent recoveries and destination of reject and cleaning solutions is a good idea. Determine what are all the potential fallouts. Again, some of them might, might not be so obvious. So I guess perform a mass balance and look at the overall design very, very carefully. Um, ceramic membranes are, are getting more popular as new materials and designs uh, drive the costs down. There are advantages. Um, should be evaluated in some cases where you have high temperature or troublesome fallants and the need for strong cleaners that would damage the typically used polymerics are suitable for the ceramics. So again, those are a consideration with new technology. 
Um, there are big benefits in many systems if you can improve the kinetics using computational fluid designs. So an example would be a, a turbo mix, and a turbo mix is a, is a nice design in front of a clarifier and other treatment processes because it, it you know, can uh, allow shorter reaction times, use smaller mix tanks because of the improved kinetics, and uh, it can reduce the, the chemical consumptions also. We've seen it as much as a 20% reduction because of the um, improved reactions. Another type of new, newer technology might be disc filters. They're a nice option for many situations. And they use membranes of different sizes, depending on what the water quality is. And uh, the flow is by gravity from outside to in on each one of the disc sets. They advance when the feeder trough level rises, because this is indicating you know, the, the membranes are getting fouled. So it rotates, and the dirty section, sections are sprayed in the opposite, um, opposite direction of the flow. A uh, nice advantage of these is they are small footprint and less expensive than media filters. So I guess uh, just a quick design review of what I was just talking about is that you want to do the work up front and get a thorough understanding of the needs. Um, make sure you understand and consider all of the liabilities. And then you, you can construct the design basis very carefully and use all the good engineering and, uh, practices and sound designs. And then as a few examples that I just showed here, you might include some new technologies if it's appropriate. Well, thank you so much, Dave. That was fabulous information. And now we're going to hear from our third speaker, Colin Frayne. A little bit of background on Colin. Colin Frayne's a lecturer and the owner of Aquasurance Incorporated, a small but international water technologies consulting business. Colin is an industrial chemist, corrosion engineer, and environmental scientist. He's a published technical author with several books to his name, including Boiler Water Treatment Principles and Practice, Volumes 1-2, and Cooling Water Treatment Principles and Practice, published by Chemical Publishing Company and also available on Novel. As well, he's written dozens of technical articles. And Colin, I'd like to welcome you to the webinar. Thank you, Laurie. It's uh, great to be here, and uh, hello to everybody out there. All right. And Dave just covered water system requirements from a pretreatment equipment point of view. And Colin is going to discuss some system requirements from a water quality and water chemistry approach, including chemical treatments used in these systems. So uh, over to you, Colin. OK, thank you very much, Laurie. OK, so the, uh, the first slide that we've got goes back to what uh, Lorraine was saying. In fact, this is the design basis. The design basis is critical, and it was clear from what we uh, heard earlier that in the poll that, in general, we're having poorer quality waters, and they're also variable. So as I've said here, the design basis for water employed generally as a heat transfer vehicle in heating and cooling or for specific processes is driven by the pretreatment technology employed. It's driven by the consistency of the water quality um, and any specific stresses or other issues related to the intended use of the water. And then also the design basis has to take into account the control of the water chemistry during the system or the process operation. That's not just the chemistry itself, but who's actually looking after it, how competent they are, the skills at interpreting what's going on. So the design basis will drive the equipment design. If you have poor quality water, as apparently a lot of us do, but excellent chemical feed, control systems, good pretreatment, you can probably operate with a smaller margin of safety for water chemistry. But if you've got better water, average water, but unfortunately poor chemical control, you're going to have to have a wider operating envelope and you're not going to be able to optimize the water if water side efficiency. So everything is going to be a trade-off, and usually the trade-off is relating to, uh, to money. However, let's have a look at the, uh, the, the uh, second slide. Again, the poll said we have uh, raw water that's often poor, and you can see here, raw water quality is the key. What is it that we've got to work with? How variable is it? What's its precise quality? Do we an, uh, are we able to analyze it properly? And have we got good data resulting from a, uh, a wide variety of, of numbers and, and times of taking the samples? 
and we got surface water, well water, sea water, brackish water, or possibly rainwater or recycled or retreated water. So, obstacles to reliable industrial operations due to the raw water quality include, as we've said, the types and concentrations of naturally occurring contaminants in the water, the seasonal or other variabilities of quality. <clears throat> have we got a good design basis? Do we have a fit for purpose pretreatment system? And we have to understand the control of the polishing chemical treatments. The fact is that the sheer number of variations in the quality of water sources around the world that we have, we've then got to find a way to match those to the industrial system requirements. We've got to be able to provide for a wide potential permutation in the basis of pretreatment design and operation and control. And that's why Dave was at great pains to say, look at everything, ask everybody, try and find out as much as you can before we go too far down the line. So the next slide, we are then wanting to, uh, to, to say that water is an excellent solvent. And so the types and concentration of the various dissolved minerals in the water plus the water system operational concentration effects that we're going to look at a little later, plus other local operating conditions, equals the degree of risk of water site problems developing. And if they do, as Lorraine said, we're going to end up with a domino effect, a chain of cause and effect. Typically, the, the primary use for us of industrial waters is for uh, heating and cooling and both processes result in the concentration of naturally occurring dissolved contaminants. These may supersaturate at a particular level. They can cause scaling, corrosion, other problems. There may well be additional problems due to process leaks or in the case of cooling water systems the scrubbing effect of airborne contaminants. Also, local operating conditions such as a critical heat exchanger may result in very stressful operating conditions. If we've got low water flow, that can cause us more problems. So, the presence and concentration of natural impurities and the introduced contaminants in the water can then promote a wide variety of problems in just about every kind of water system that we have. The typical effects, you may notice, are hindering of heat transfer and steam generation processes which cost us money, adverse quality and purity of steam and the fact that the impurities are primary instigators in this domino effect of metals corrosion and wastage. We can get uh, crystalline, non-crystalline scales, sludges and phalanx. They might be mineral, they might be biological in nature and if they're biological we then might get microbial induced corrosion as well. It's a fact that the poor, wallet, uh, poor water and, and chemistry management is ultimately going to result in higher fuel costs, loss of production and increased demands for maintenance. I said in the previous slide that whenever water side problems emerge in any water system, there's a domino effect. There's never a single problem and so it's necessary to understand the root cause of the problems or the potential problems and ensure appropriate front-end action are taken ahead of time. Now, of course, if the front-end action can be a really fit-for-purpose pretreatment plan, then so much the better. But in any case, ultimately, we're going to have to get down to some sort of water treatment chemistry and water side control, and that will only ever work if we have clean and well-passivated water side surfaces. Failure to clean and, and well passivate is going to result in damaging problems down the line and unscheduled repairs and maintenance. So, can we save water and energy? Uh, at what point will the risks of problems exceed benefits of the water savings? The more times we can reuse the same water in an industrial operation, say by recycling in a, in a cooling tower or reusing boiler water condensate, the greater is our savings in water, energy and chemical treatment consumption. 
but because of the presence of these various dissolved minerals, gases and other contaminants, there comes a point at which the risk of problem developing outweighs the benefits from saving and reusing water. We can go to higher quality chemistries and more control, but we have to understand the risk benefit equation and we have to factor this into our thinking. So in view of the water side risk benefit equation it's worth uh, recalling Lorraine's first words. Understand what can go wrong. What are the hidden liabilities in the influent water such as COD, BOD, ammonia, suspended solids, pH. Understand what treatment and control technologies are available for, from people like Dave to minimize risk and maximize the efficiency, especially if we're moving towards more recycled and poorer water qualities. And, and it's important to define and communicate the system requirements to vendors, otherwise they won't be able to, to help you. And remember again, as Lorraine said, chemical treatments are polishing treatments. They're not a substitute for Dave's pretreatment options. Nevertheless, there are a wide variety of, uh, of control chemicals today, and the chemicals that we increasingly use are organic and multifunctional. We're seeing the gradual demise of inorganic such as zinc, molybdenum, and phosphate as inhibitors, and today's inhibitor formulations are using blends of chemistries, each of which function by a variety of mechanisms. There's actually hundreds of potential chemicals, but perhaps only dozens of really good, well-used chemistries that we have good information from, and they can come from a variety of vendors. And what we're looking to do is to work uh, synergistically uh, so that each of the chemicals together can maximize operating efficiencies and yet minimize the chemistry costs. So we can um, design fit for purpose and uh, economy, uh, economical systems either based on um, our uh, in-house knowledge, the fact that we may have 20, 30, 40 years of experience, but increasingly we're looking at software programs to help us understand what's the best possible inhibitor chemistries, where do we get them from, what the benefits are, but also the limitations. And, and so the truth is it ends up that water chemistry is as much an art as it is a science. So we can have good chemistries, we can have, in fact, the very best chemistries, but unless we can monitor and interpret uh, all of those water chemistries, that's not going to do very much for us. We want to be able to schedule the review visits. We know, need to know how earlier we can fix problems. And obviously, we, we can't afford to run out of chemistries. It's good now that there are newer designs of monitoring and control systems available. They're being more widely used. We can now see automatic report emailing. We can be away from the site and still get remote web-based monitoring. And we're seeing much more now in the way of fluorescent control systems using chemistries like PTSA. You may know that as perhaps a Tracer device, but there are other alternatives to Tracer these days. So. Okay, Finally, Co to, uh, Colin, to uh, in interest of time, actually, I'm going to ask us to forego the summary. Sure. And I'll go ahead and ask Lorraine to come back on and just give us a, a brief summary of the entire uh, topic today. Thank so, you, Lori. Yes. I hope that we persuaded you that beginning with an understanding of risk is an excellent way to analyze your pretreatment system problems, be it in design or in operation. So clearly understanding the risk involves looking at that poor quality water, looking at the mismatch of equipment and operation with that water quality, and recognizing that pretreatment systems, especially if they are single train units, can be a single point of failure and can also cause that domino effect in downstream units. All those things are important to minimizing the risk, including Dave's equipment options, Colin's discussion of chemical treatment and those strategies, and practicing good engineering and sound design by characterizing that all-important design basis that encompasses 
the equipment, the water quality, and the dynamic operation and changes in those two. Well, thank you so much, Lorraine. And I know we've covered a lot of ground today. And before we start addressing some of the great questions that are coming in from all the folks in our audience, we do have one final very quick poll question that we'd like to pose. So if you would take just a moment to respond to our question, what methods are you considering to increase the quality, uh, the quantity and quality of your water supply? And in this case, you can go ahead and select all that apply. So is it water conservation, water reuse, lower quality of water sources, other recycled water sources, not currently planning on, uh, not currently planning or investigating. So go ahead and let us know what your thoughts are here. And uh, our panel, does anyone have uh, comments on those results? Well, I'm gratified to see that water reuse is at the top of the list mm -hmm. and water conservation is not far behind. Water conservation is a natural first step to thinking about water reuse because it's typically easier to get with less cost for infrastructure changes uh, or chemical changes. All right. Well, thank you very much, Lorraine. And at this point, I would like to call all three of our panelists to the virtual podium, and we could start addressing some of these questions coming in. And the first one here I see for, uh, looks like a good one for Dave. Uh, Dave, when should you start talking to equipment suppliers if you have a project uh, in mind? Yeah, well, I hope I made that point, um, but the sooner the better, because what probably the hardest thing to do is come in late in the game uh, and not really do all the detective work and get all the right questions asked and, and see as many people and talk to as many people and really find out what all the ultimate goals are, because from the very beginning, if you if you do all that, you're going to you're going to prevent some of the problems later on. Okay, thank you. Uh, this one coming in from Susan um, Lorraine. In your experience, which pretreatment systems has the most risk, and why? Well, it's not one unit; rather, the characteristics of the unit. Any centralized unit, a single train unit that has no redundancy, that has the greatest risk. And the risk is actually higher the further upstream in the circuit it is. So your influent clarifier, which is usually the first system, if it's single train, that's the very highest risk. And if it does not have online monitoring and remote alarms in the central control room, it's at even higher risk. And I guess one last comment, I haven't mentioned the risk that occurs due to operational issues, in other words, poor maintenance, poor control of chemistry, uh, operational misunderstanding. I, I guess I would say to this hard question, the bottom line is that assessing the risk of your pretreatment system requires that thoughtful review of inter infrastructure, equipment performance, and operational effectiveness. Well, thank you very much, Lorraine. And I've got one here from Bill. This one looks like a good one for Colin. Uh, Colin, we've experienced deep pitting corrosion in the steel end boxes of some large critical heat exchangers. But changing water treatment vendors and their products does not seem to have cured the problem. Do you know why? Uh, well, in truth, no, I don't know why, and I'd have to investigate, but I suspect it's this domino effect again that Lorraine has talked about. Um, perhaps there is a, a low flow, and that low flow has enabled um, suspended solids to, uh, to fall out there. Now, if, if we don't have sufficient multimedia filters, side stream filters in, we're going to have high loadings of suspended solids in the, in the cooling tower. If the flow rate is low, then the heat exchangers will suffer from deposition in that low flow area. And underneath that deposition, we're then going to get tubercolation corrosion on the deposit corrosion. So again, I suspect it's probably not one cause. Um, it is probably not the chemistry. It's more to do with this domino effect starting from uh, poor pretreatment design. All right. Thank you, Colin. And this one, I'm, I'm not sure who to direct it at, so maybe uh, our palace, you guys can help me. Question coming from Aaron. 
what specific guidance can you give regarding water pretreatment for industrial and potable use for the offshore and marine industry? So which of you would like to take a stab at that one? Well, no answer there. <coughs> can you can you just repeat that question again, please, Absolutely. Laurie? What specific guidance can you give regarding water pretreatment for industrial and potable use for the offshore and marine industry? I, I might take that a little bit. It's a pretty loaded question because mm. uh, it really depends on the water quality and stuff. Yep. But, I mean, in the offshore, one of the big, big uh, users is sulfate removal. Um, and so now you're talking about proper pretreatment and, and proper design for sure and looking at the water chemistry and then anti-scalins for calcium sulfate for potable. Uh, again, the same thing. This would be talking about really what is the water quality coming in and the variability in the water characteristics and then looking at the right design or the right piece of equipment or systems of equipment to give you the potable water or whatever the specific industrial process water needs are. You're quite right, Dave. Usually with potable, you, you can have uh, seawater reverse osmosis or maybe multi-effect vaporization process. Um, and if you don't understand that raw water quality that you've got and treat it properly, then you're going to end up with uh, scaling and fouling problems in that kind of equipment. And I guess it's yeah. going to be the same for, for the industrial use. Um, you've always got this problem of risk and, uh, of, of scale and corrosion taking place. So again, understand what water quality you've got and make sure that you understand what the design needs to be to properly pretreat. Yeah, and the offshore design usually is space limited, so push space is real important. Yes. Okay, I've got one here. Looks like a good one for you, Colin. It's from Jean, and um, Jean would like to know what is the best best method for removing silica. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not sure where the silica is taking place. If it's going to be in a, in a, in a uh, high-pressure boiler unit, um, then probably it's going to be using hydrofluoric acid uh, with, uh, with ammonia. It's difficult. It can be done, I think. But again, if it's, if it's a cooling system, it's a totally different uh, concept. This is one of these well, questions where you have to understand where did the silica originate from? because I might well be able to find a chemical program or even a mechanical program to remove the silica, but it's going to come back again unless I understand the source of it. I've been working with uh, some uh, water systems that's got 80, 90 ppm of silica in, and we've had to go to great lengths to ensure that the pretreatment design is such that it's going to be able to deal with those levels of silica when the water concentrates up. So. I can't really answer it in terms of a chemical treatment program because I don't know what kind of system it is, but it definitely comes down to understanding the, uh, the, the source of it and taking care that it doesn't occur again. I might interject that the, uh, the way I would answer that question is to take it out before you have any deposit problems. Yes. And yes. So depending on what else is in there, you know, if you're looking at cold lime softening, you make sure you've got a magnesium source in there. You might mm -hmm. have to feed sub supplemental magnesium. Yes. Uh, if you've got colloidal silica, um, you know, membrane systems can be used for taking out the A colloidal silica. A desilicized, David. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, more information is necessary, but there's a lot of options. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. And uh, this one coming in from Roger. Uh, how do I get started with a water reuse project? Oh, I'll take that one. Interestingly enough, um, water reuse projects really start with some homework about making a process flow map of your utility systems that characterizes all of your water streams, both purified water as well as wastewater, um, and looking at each of your units for efficiency and water conservation, and looking at each user and the specification for each unit. Only then can you move on to an actual potential capital project of specifying a technology and either purchasing or renting additional equipment or other chemicals methods to be able to reuse water. So there's really a lot of homework that has to go on of understanding your system and like we said, characterizing your risks before you actually get to the project part of water reuse. 
So, so yeah. Lorraine, you think that, that it's critical to understand the mass balance for the whole system and then perhaps look at individual components and see if with simple treatment methods you can actually reuse water from uh, waste of one system into another? Absolutely. Excellent way to characterize it. Yeah, and the, and the one thing that I'd add on that is to also include when you're doing all the mass balances, all the chemicals that are used, the acids, the ferrics, the limes, because that's going to all contribute to the mass balance. Now, um, I, I love the conversation that we've got going. It looks like we're just bumping up on the top of the hour, so let me share with folks uh, how we can continue the conversation. So there were so many great questions. If we didn't get to yours, you can expect an answer within a week. And in the meantime, we would love to hear from all of you and continue the conversation. So let's take a look at how we can do that um, on Facebook. You can find us, facebook.com forward slash novel. Just visit the discussions tab and look for the title of today's webinar. Twitter hashtag still valid. Uh, learn more about Novel at Novel's website, www.novel.com. And learn more about um, Chemical Publishing Company and Golf Publishing Companies at their websites just listed on the screen. But before we sign off, I would like to say thank you to each of you for joining us. And I trust that you found today to be of value. And of course, special thanks to Dave, Colin, and Lorraine, and our sponsors, Novel and Chemical Publishing Company and Golf Publishing Company. Uh, also, a special thanks to our logistics producer, Patty Van Hooser, working in the background for the behind-the-scenes collaboration and support. Most importantly, thank you for joining us. And as your moderator, this is Lori Dearman saying, have a great rest of the week. Bye for now.